Hey y'all, this is Sean Gerber. Thank you so much for listening today. But before we get started, I have a question for you. Would you like to finally pass the CISSP and get started building a lucrative and rewarding career in cybersecurity? I can help you over at CISSPCybertraining.com with the resources and tools you need to pass the CISSP the first time. At CISSPCybertraining.com, there's a vast array of resources available that will give you the guidance, direction, and training you need to pass the CISSP exam. As soon as you get done with this presentation, head on over to CISSPCybertraining.com so that I can begin helping you today to meet your CISSP goals and grow your career in cybersecurity. All right, let's get started. Welcome to the Reduce Cyber Risk and CISSP Training Podcast, where we provide you the training and tools you need to pass the CISSP exam the first time. Hi, my name is Sean Gerber, and I'm your host for this action-packed, informative podcast, Join me each week as I provide the information you need to pass the CISSP exam and grow your cybersecurity knowledge. All right, let's get started. Hey, all is Sean Gerber again with Reduce Cyber Risk. How are you all doing this beautiful, beautiful morning? Hope things are going well in your part of the globe in this big, shiny blue marble. Things are going awesome in Wichita, Kansas. Yes, the small little town of Wichita, Kansas. It's going well. I cannot complain at all. It's a beautiful summer day. School's getting ready to get started, and uh, my kids are getting ready to go back to school, which is an awesome thing. Very, very cool. It's uh, one of those uh, situations in your life when you have, if, if, when you have, ever have children out there. Kids are great most days. Other days, yeah, not so much. And so when it comes to going back to school, most parents will just glee with be or be super happy with glee. See, that wasn't a really good word there. But anyway, they're really super happy because of the fact that the, the kids are no longer at home and they're now focused on school. So yeah, it's a, it's a good thing. Well, today we're going to be talking about software development and how is the security around that. And you'll see many things that have occurred. Recently, there was just a recent breach that hit with the Capital One here in the United States. And they said there was probably, I don't know how many millions of people were affected by that. And and so, therefore, what ended up happening is is there was, there was an insider threat issue. Well, the, today we're not going to talk about the insider. We're going to talk more about the software development. But in the case of when you're creating apps or create from your websites, whether you're creating apps for the App Store that go into the Google Play or iTunes, all of that needs to have some level of software development development security built into it. And so there's some key aspects we're going to go into as it relates to doing that. Along with that is going to be the main things that you're going to have to know for the CISSP exam. As you know, reduce cyber risk. And my ultimate plan is is to be able to give you the CISSP training you need to pass the CISSP the first time. Again, we want to go into that. You want to pass this. I know this test is a bugger. Been there, done that. We're going to have some upcoming episodes. We're going to talk a little bit more about the exam. But bottom line is, is this test is a bugger. And I failed it the first time. I studied my butt off for that test. I studied basically three months just self-study just to go put pass the test because at the time there there were boot camps but I didn't have the funds to be able to go pay for a boot camp and so I've studied it and it was actually good that I studied just because of the fact that it, it helped me get a good knowledge of what I deal with on a daily basis but the cool part about knowing the CISSP and passing the exam the first time is the fact that you will utilize those skills on a daily basis as a CISO for a large multinational so those are things to consider is that the good thing is just just by taking the test is the the first step in the exam or is the uh, first step in the whole road to make becoming a cybersecurity professional. And so therefore, it's it's imperative that you get these foundations and you know these fundamentals. And studying a bunch of, of test questions is very important, you know, just to understand what are they going to ask for and how they're going to ask. But those test questions are designed mainly to help you as you go through them, understand the questions and how would they answer, how would they question you or how would they provide the information for you so that the answers you provide are the right ones. But again, can't just, sorry to digress, but the cool part about studying for the CISSP is the fact that you get to learn a lot of good stuff. Well, today we're going to learn about software development and the security that goes into that. So the, when I talk about my CISSP cybersecurity integration, this is the pay, area that I grab some information from the internet, like an article or so forth. And this one is software development lifecycle, and we'll get into that. And that's it's an interesting piece that you should understand your software development lifecycle from beginning to end. So from the beginning when it was conceived, 
to your beautiful mind to when it dies and is rotting in the ground. So that, that's the, but in some cases, some of these apps, I, I mean, I've got apps that were in our environment that are from the 1970s. So they never die. They just get a little aged. Uh, CISSP training, we're going to talk about integrate security in the software development lifecycle. I we're going to integrate that in domain eight. And then the CISSP exam questions are obviously around development security and SDLC. All right, let's get, get into it. Yeah, so this is CISSP Cybersecurity Integration. This is the InfoSec Institute reference, and I, that's the who we're going to be calling up today from their website. And they're going to be talk. We talk about 8.1 Software Development Lifecycle. This is if you are have the CISSP, the ISC squared document that focuses on the different subchapters around the ISC. This is 8.1 that's called out in that document. This is Software Development Lifecycle. Okay, as I talked about in the intro, applications are becoming more and more complex. And, and so therefore, we're seeing these things that are tied together. Now, in the past, you would have, you had just an app. That, let's just, I say the past. It's a distant past where it was, uh, you're just, your app store was set up with iTunes or with Google Play. And you had, that was your app. Or you had, you'd build some sort of application that had a offering a, ser, a, a software as a service where you'd log into a web portal and you would have access to it that way. Now, what ends up happening is, is these applications are becoming more complex because you have edge computing that's dealing with Amazon AWS. You have your apps that you put on your phone and your phone, these things are extremely powerful. So therefore, that is able to com do massive computation. So as technology continues to grow and get faster and faster, these applications are growing in size and complexity as well. And so security needs to be a key factor in when your successful implementation of your application. Now, whether this is an intentional or unintentional, it, it really doesn't matter. The fact of it is you got to do it and you really need to look at how you keep software embedded within your environment. Now, software and hardware controls are extremely important. And so if you're going to put any sort of app out there at all, you need to have these controls in place. Now, as you're dealing with soft, uh, soft development controls, system development controls that are needed for the CISSP exam, there's some key things you need to keep in mind. Now, system development steps need for creating, modifying, or maximizing information systems. So you need to have steps in place that are going to be used to help when you're dealing with creating, modifying, or maximizing your information system. That's a key term that you're going to run into on the CISSP. And you need to have a formal activity set up for development so that you're having, like in the case of myself, I have a development team. They work for me. Uh, they work out of India and they do a great job and they do an awesome job and they have a ability to do development. And they're in the process of building out an entire suite of things that they need to do from, from their initial development products to CICD to automated testing, so on and so forth. All that needs to be put in place. Well, when you're dealing with that, you also need to have some level of security built into it as well. And you need to create development standards around this coding. And we've run into this with third parties. So if I have a third party that helps me and they provide some sort of coding, then what is the standard by which they're developing their codes? So that's an important piece of this is that what are the aspects from the development standards? How can they do this? Now, it could be as simple as a checklist. They it could be my naming convention is this. We have we do have a we do fuzz testing on the application when it's done. We have you know all these little steps can be built into their process and they just go through it step by step. Now, I have noticed the challenges that go into this because the developers are they get paid, they're incentivized to develop quickly and to develop with good code, but develop quickly. And so therefore, sometimes they don't want to take the time to do the initial steps to run it through a scanning engine to make sure that it does that it works. So those are those are conditions that you need to help in uh, talk to your people about and ensure that they're connected with it. Now, the OWASP SAM core model. Now, OWASP is an organization that's on, uh, that provides development for uh, web applications. And it's basically web applications and, and what are the aspects around securing those web applications. So you can go to OWASP and check it out online. They have a whole laundry list of things you can use specifically for ensuring that your product is properly secured, your application. I mean, they have all kinds from scanners to best practices. I mean, it's a really good place if you are a application developer and you're looking to incorporate security within your environment. They have a software assurance model. That's the SAM, the software assurance maturity model. And it's basically an open framework. And we like to talk about frameworks, but it's realistically, it's a guide or a checklist. The checklist is a little bit too tight, but it's more of a guide to formulate a strategy around 
applications. And it evaluates the organization's existing security practices while puts in well-defined iterations for their software. It demonstrates concrete improvements and it measures the security related activity. So the bottom line is it breaks it down for you to be able to put security into your right now, your current process. So it's just a good framework and a good checklist to go by. I highly recommend checking out OWASP. They have a great product out there and you will be caught, it will be called upon it on the CISSP. Now they may not call it the OWASP specifically, but their 20 best practices that they have are, will be, will be called out specifically within the CISSP. Those practice, those best practices, coding practices, you, you may see that. Now, their top 10 proactive controls, so this is of 2016. First one is verify the security early and often, obviously, right? But you need to stay on top of it but rather than having something go into production and then have to do scans for it. Parameterize queries, encode data, validate all inputs. That's a huge one there where you have inputs that are going in for a form field and you validate that, that yeah, this, I want a date of birth to go in here and I don't want Java code to be put into here. I want just date of birth. That needs to be a, a, an input validation step that needs to be considered. Implement identity and authentication controls, huge. Implement appropriate access controls, protect the data. Again, now if you're dealing with applications that are just basic wonky data, that may not be such an important step. However, if you're dealing with any sort of personal data or data for your company that's considered confidential, and if you're building an app that is for somebody else, you need to consider that. Would that data be, be possibly considered confidential? Then you need to look at protecting the data. You need to implement logging and intrusion detection. This is one we had last week from talking about logging leverage security frameworks and libraries, and then error and exception handling. So those top 10, if you did those, that would do a dramatically reduce the risk to your sites. And what would end up happening is, is you'd put you in a much better position as it relates to your site being affected by uh, hackers or uh, the like. Now, as you're dealing with SDLC, there are some key aspects to keep in mind. One is planning or planning and requirement gathering. You need to understand when you're dealing with your development, what are the requirements around it? Also, architecture and design. How are you designing your uh, application and your software out there? What is the purpose behind it? And then how do you make sure that it's, it maintains be updated? How do you update it? How is that is that built into the overall development strategy? Test planning. How do you test strategy over development code? So how do you build that out till you're going to test to ensure that it does not like your input validations? What would you put in there to ensure that the wrong input validations don't get put in and they could run potentially run code on your server? Coding and implementation, ensuring code is complete by dividing into various modules, testing and deployment, and that would be product development based on requirements, and then your release and maintenance, your final product release and its maintenance, and then maintaining that product. But again, you have to begin this from the beginning of when they of the light of the application or the software is born to when it dies or guess what it may not die unless you kill it especially as we're dealing with software as a service you can kill these things but if you go out individual programs that are going out that kind of stuff it stays around forever so just consider that whatever you make what is the way you're going to be able to update it and um, do you want to deal with that headache for a long period of time now, one thing also about the CIS, CISSP, they talk about SDLC models that are covered in the CISSP. Now, the most common are there, there's various commons that are open or various models that are open. And I'm going to go over some of these right now. But the, the main one that I deal with is a, a Scrum. And you'll see that model here in just a little bit. Or I should say Agile. And that Scrum's a method of doing it. It's actually because uh, Scrum is like with uh, uh, rugby. But no, it's Agile, the Agile method. And we'll get into that just here in just a second. Uh, waterfall model. This is the most common model and has typically been used by many in the past. And this basically, basically comes down to is you finish one phase and then you go on to the next. But there's not much room for making changes to the waterfall model. You have to wait until the whole process is done before you can go make go back and make changes. So if you notice that there's changes while you're in the middle of the of the sprint with the waterfall model, there's very little leeway to go back and make changes to it. You have to basically come back around after the whole thing is done. The V-shaped model, which is verification and validation model, and it's very similar to the waterfall, but each phase has a testing phase. So the good piece of that is you don't wait to the end to find that you have issues. You, each phase will give you some sort of testing, and then you can make you can put that in the backlog and then make iterations to that. But it, it is still though the overall project. If you have like five sprints for this one project, you may get all the way through the project and then realize, okay, now I need to go back and make, fix those changes. The iterative model, which is repletion and improvement, and basically that comes back and it repeat, re repeats it, and then it improves it, and it takes care of those things. It's a set of requirements that are 
tested and implemented. And you basically are you're iterating, you're going back and forth, back and forth. And the new very versions are based on new and iterative versions of the software. So as your software gets updated, a new iteration has occurred, then they come back and make changes, and it just keeps going in that process. It's a very it gets you a very viable product early. So if you're dealing with the VIP, which is your vi viable product, that's a very good point. It gets you there in a, in a very quick period of time, but it may take lots of resources to do that because there's a lot of things that are going on, especially you're having to iterate it over and over again. And again, these models are designed not to be one is the only one you do. They're designed to, depending upon your situation, which model would you use? The waterfall, 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 the V-shaped model or the iterative model. Now we have the spiral model. Now this works in an iterative model, basically it starts by continually repeating it over and over and over again, but it kind of goes out. It allows for improvements on each round. So just you repeat phases, the four phases over and over and over. And so you just keep going in a circle. The big bang model, typically good for small projects, little work being done on planning, and most of the resources are for development. And what that comes into is you bang, you're done. You just hit it hard. Everybody jumps in, all hands on deck. And that's the big bang model. But if you're doing with a small project that is very tiny in nature and that you can do quickly, that would be a really good model to use. The agile model, again, this is one that I use, customer interaction and feedback. So you're basically reaching out to the product owners and getting feedback from them on how the process is going. You have a backlog. Sprints are usually in two week cycles. And what ends up happening is you'll, you'll go through the backlog. You'll prioritize what you're going to do. You do that product. And then at the end of it, you, the next sprint, anything that is considered a, a bug that isn't critical gets thrown back in the backlog and then it gets reprioritized in the next sprint. It's basically you, you test it at each iteration. And so there is testing. It's put into uh, testing your production or staging and production. And so that process is done through the agile model. Again, it depends on which one works best for you and your organization. So in the past, you would test after completion strategy for security, and it, they would typically do this at the end of everything. If And I say that even if the case is many times, they wouldn't even test. But it does leave you vulnerable, especially if you're waiting to the end and things have been in production. Incorporating security at the beginning does help create more secure applications, and it reduces your overall risk. Uh, it, from someone getting access to you. And especially during the time when you maybe if you find a mistake, but you know what, you fixed eight of the 10, but you found two of them that are vulnerable. Well, that's good. That's, I mean, at least there's only two versus if you don't add security from the beginning, you now have 10 plus and, and that causes a lot of issues. You incorporate code review and pen testing in your architecture analysis. And there's different SDLC models available. Microsoft has a development model MSDL. And then NIST also talks about it with 800-64, which is the National National Institute of Technology. And this 800-64 does provide security considerations into system development lifecycle. Now, there's also another model. It's called CLASP, which is a comprehensive lightweight application security process, CLASP. And this says a set of processes mapped to job roles and allows for early security and stages. So again, there's different SDLC models that you have to look at. And when it comes to the CISSP, they're going to focus on what are some models that are available. And I say, when I say that's going to, it's, it's one of the questions that you could run into. It doesn't mean that this specific question is on the test. No, I'm not saying that at all. But it is a like Microsoft's development lifecycle. One question you could potentially see is when considering SDLC models that are available to you, which one of the following is a model? The Model T by Ford, the Model Vega from the car, the Model XYZ, or the Microsoft Security Development Lifecycle model? Uh, or which which uh, government organization helps you with this? And that's and the NIST 800-64. So those are the questions that you could see on the CISSP exam. Okay, that's all I had for the CISSP integration. And now we're going to roll into the CISSP training 8.1, Understand and Integrate Security in Software Development Lifecycle. That's the plan we're going to talk about in this next objective uh, as part of the Cyber Reduce Cyber Risk podcast. And there's going to be your CISSP training is going to be available to you. All of the videos that I've created over the time around CISSP are going to be there. The CISSP training manual that's or videos that are focused on the ISC squared exam that are there. There's about 129 different videos that you can watch. that will take you through zero all the way to hero. And the cool part about it is at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, it will set you up substantially 
substantially for to pass the CISSP exam because it, it just really will. You have the knowledge you get from those videos, what you've done on your own, and if you want to go self-study for the test, you are going to have a sub substantial chance of passing the test. I, I mean, you'll pass it the first time, and that's the ultimate goal is that we want to help you pass it the first time. All right, so let's roll right into the training. Okay, so we're looking at security again for software environments. Now, this is to, all this information I'm providing you is considered out of the ISC Square training manuals that have been provided. So what you saw with the original CISSP integration is from InfoSec Institute. This is actually out of my knowledge and working with the also the ISC, ISC Squared tr official training manual for 2018. Now, when you're talking with key aspects, you need to avoid developers, you need to prevent developers in a work environment from creating an environment that is bad for software. You also need to have the ability to apply technical controls where appropriate in your software environment. And it's also important to understand that what could happen if your software development area is compromised. What would somebody get if they got into your code repository? What if they got into your, your code and development environment? So what are some key aspects to keep in mind there? Especially if you're developing apps for your company, what kind of credentials could they potentially steal to utilize and leverage against you? Development security considerations. You need to have a separate business and development functions. And this would come into the place where you have email slash document management in a for, should be separate from development. They, they need to be in separate environments. Not necessarily need to be in separate, completely separate environments, but they need to not be work your, your daily work stuff and your development stuff should be separate. You need to utilize Active Directory groups and or virtual machines as you're looking at creating your security environment. So those are important things. Again, that separates from the business environment, the business network. Consider development environment has been compromised. So if you look at it from a standpoint of a business, or I should say most develop or most networks, you need to consider as you're building out security and as you're looking at what's available to you, that the fact that your development environment might be compromised. And that means you need to separate your admin and user accounts. They cannot have the same ability to work on the same things. And you need to incorporate multi-factor as it relates to dealing with security for your environment. It deals with your the PIN. You have, a, like say, uh, you go and you log in, you have to enter in a multi-factor code that's on your phone, the second token that allows you in. There also would request like multi-person review. A good thing is to have someone within your organization review your code before it gets shipped to production. That allows to look for any sort of bugs that may be there or something else that may have affected it. Also look at trust but verify. You need to trust your individuals but not necessarily their accounts. And that's another thing to consider is that as you are dealing with these accounts or people, your people who are working for you, you need to trust them, but their individual network accounts could be compromised and they wouldn't even know it. So it's important that you do trust your people but not their, their individual accounts. You need to incorporate logging and monitoring, which we talked about last week, and the importance of doing that. Security actions, you need to reduce your attack surface. And by doing that is that if you have a, something in production, don't have a lot of spurious pages that are sitting out there available for people to go and attack. Keep it clean, keep it crisp. And you need to protect your assets, the, your credentials to get into your property. It's imperative that you do that. Secret keys are important as well. And then you also need to understand from an incident response standpoint, what is the impact of a compromise and ensure that those controls are in place to limit slash manage the compromise if it does occur. Keep production and development environments separate and then ensure again when logging and monitoring is, in, is enabled and being monitored. The problem is, is turning on logging and monitoring is great, but if you don't do anything with it, eh, not so much. So it's imperative that you do things like that. Now, when you're dealing with configuration management as an aspect of secure coding, you need to impact the analysis of your change. And you need to request change that needs to be done through the sprint cycle. It doesn't mean you go in and just make changes. You should have a sprint cycle set up, whether using one of those different waterfall methods, and you need to go ahead and put that change in. You also need to have a formal approval process to make that change and put that into place. Highly recommended that you, people are involved in conversations on the phone. And if you have an automated change request process, there needs to be some way to to verify that so that if somebody got in a hacker and said, hey, add this level of code into your environment, please. That would be a bad thing. Also approve and reject changes. You need to have a formal process on how to deal with that. 
and then ways to test the change that is in your environment. Basically a non-production location that you could do through, like you could have it set up on AWS or someplace like that, that it has a pipeline where it would actually go through and run automated testing. You have that place to check for change. Schedule a time to change the production. Again, come back to when would you do this? Have a planned orchestrated event and then document the change. Make annotations in the document control. Now, as you're dealing with versioning, you need to have some level of nomenclature around this. You need to have a, a naming convention. And this could come down to some level of la labeling. You got your 1.0, your 1.1, your 1.2, so on and so forth. And you need to have documentation around your versioning and why you did it. This software configuration management is imperative as it deals with version controls. And it, the one thing I've, I've learned is that documentation around versioning is definitely a, it's, it's an art and, and how people do it. And then the commenting that goes along with the versioning and labeling. The, what'll cause issues is if you have ineffective version controls, it will cause outages and issues. And because what it comes down to is people don't understand why you're going from 1.1 to 1.111.1.11.1. .1 .1 .1 .1 .1 .1 .1. Yeah, I just confused myself. See how easy it is? That can happen to anybody. So the point of that is, is versioning is important, but you need to have that defined in a written format somewhere. Now, your code repositories. These are impo very important that you take care of your code repositories. Because of the fact they keep everything there, they act as a central location for developers. Your GitHub, your Bitbucket, your SourceForge, all of those act as a code repository. And so you need to understand the security around that. Because again, if a hacker gets into those, what's they gonna get? They're gonna get all of your code. Well, if your code has proprietary information in it, that would be bad. That'll take you out of business. Your competitor could get it, and now you're done. You also need to look at a single sign-on or multi-factor piece to this as well. Avoid the use of API keys in the code repository. So the API key basically is set up so that it will connect to something else and you, your API key may have credit is, is acting as a credential. Well, if you have these API keys that are sitting in your code repository, somebody could utilize the API, connect into your environment, and you wouldn't even know it unless you have proper logging and monitoring enabled. And so odds are high if you have API keys in your codes, you might not have logging and monitoring enabled. And then therefore, now they're in your environment just like in they're able to pass data in and out without anybody really even seeing it. You need to have security best practices to avoid and remove any sensitive data within the repository and control access by adding removing the uh, an adding removing process. You also need to have a security.md file, which would have your disclosure policy, security update policy, configurations, and gaps and possible enhancements. Again, that's a, a message file that's available to talk about security and what could be what what needs to be changed, what has been changed, how, how can people disclose it, and so forth. You need to rotate your SSH keys and your personal tokens. Again, those are good best practices. Don't keep them the same. It's important to move that stuff around. However, we do know this. People are human and people will, if they default to the fact that it's hard to do, it, they will not do it. So it's something to consider is that many dev software development companies or many people will not rotate the keys. They just won't. And, and so therefore you need to look at how do you imp implement that into your environment. Always consider security when you are developing anything. All right, so that's all I have for the CISSP around the ISC Square Training Manual 2018. Let's roll into the CISSP exam questions. Okay, this one's on usernames and passwords. Now, considering a development security, there are some key considerations you need to be aware of. Now, I say considering twice. Considering and considerations. Those considering. All right, so there's some key things you need to consider. A, separate business and development functions. B, consider development environment compromised. C, trust but verify. D, all of the above. E, none of the above. So when considering development security, there are some key considerations you need to be aware of. Separate business and development functions. Consider the development environment is compromised. Trust but verify. Or all of the above. Or none of the above. Answer is D, all of the above. They're all crucial to thinking around development security. Again, separate business and environment. You consider your environment compromised. You trust but verify. You, ensure you, you trust your people, but at the same time, is, is you, you don't trust their credentials. Those are key things as it relates to username and password in the software development lifecycle. Okay, this one's on preventative access controls. What are the various SDLC development models covered in the CISSP exam? Waterfall. V-shape. Iterative. Agile. Spiral. And Big Bang. That was A. B is waterfall, X-shaped, repetitive, agile, 
spiral, and big bang. C, waterfall, Y-shaped. He has he's got a lot of letters there. Repetitive, agile, spiral, and big bang. Or D, none of the above. So which ones are involved in that are going to be covered by the CISSP exam? And then uh, the number is, or the letter is, A, waterfall, V-shaped, iterative, agile, spiral, and the big kahuna bang. All right, that's that question right there. Again, those are important things. You need to know the models and and what are some of the pros and the cons around each of those development models. Thanks so much for joining me today on my podcast. If you like what you heard, please leave a review on iTunes as I would greatly appreciate your feedback. Also, check out my videos that are on YouTube. Just head to my channel, CISSP Cyber Training, and you will find a plethora of content to help you pass the CISSP exam the first time. Lastly, head to CISSPCyberTraining.com and look for the free stuff that is only available to our email subscribers. Thanks again for listening. See you.